Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We got a lot of show today, breaking down news of the day with me. A.B. Burns Tucker, law student and host of I Am Legally Hype. You can find her on TikTok, YouTube. She has a remarkable story about how she got involved in criminal justice, all right? She's going to be a dynamic attorney. Top story of the day, white teen provokes a black teen, the cops come as they are fighting and they only arrest the black teen. Here's the video. You see, even the white bystanders were aware that the reason why the police only arrested the black teenager was because the black teenager was in fact black. I'm going to break down this story. I do not condone violence, nor do I celebrate it. This is a highlight in implicit and hyper aggressive bias. We're going to show you the hand in glove of how bias connects to law enforcement in this country. This happened in New Jersey. Police department has called for an internal affairs investigation. After video circulated on social media showing officers respond to a fight at Bridgewater Commons over the weekend. The video shows as you clearly see two male teens, one black, the other white, having an argument before pointing fingers at each other. They began pushing, you can see the white male push the black male. A move that sends a couch sliding along the floor and the black teen is thrown to the floor, but it's the police response. That some including voices heard on the video and Governor Phil Murphy himself. They are questioning law enforcement's response as racially motivated. Now, let me take you to a place called the Perception Institute, okay? Great website, check it out when you can. There's an interplay here. The Perception Institute breaks down a dynamic of implicit bias. Thoughts and feelings are implicit when we are unaware of them or mistaken about their nature. We have a bias when rather than being neutral, we have a preference for or aversion to a person or group of people. Thus, we use the term implicit bias to describe when we have attitudes towards people or associate stereotypes with them without our conscious knowledge. A fairly commonplace example of this is seen in studies that show white people will frequently associate criminality with black people without even realizing they're doing it. This is not a study, this is a real life review, a real life example of when white police officers responded. Immediately they associated the criminality with the black teenager. Even though the white teenager was still trying to stand up, be aggressive. As you can see, the white female officer just says, hey, buddy, sit down. We got this, as if they are the protectors of this white male. But actually, systemically, they are. Because in their bias, implicit or hyper aggressive, the result is the same. The mistreatment of other groups, people who do not fight, do, do not fit their particular white supremacy structure. It gets deeper. Black children as young as 10 may not be viewed in the same light of children or childhood innocence as their white peers. 
but are instead more likely to be mistaken as older, be perceived as guilty, and face police violence if accused of a crime. That's according to research published by the APA, the American Psychological Association. Now let me take you back to the incident. Although an investigation is still gathering the facts, this is according to the governor. Although an investigation is still gathering the facts about this incident, I'm deeply disturbed by what appears to be racially desperate treatment in this video. We're committed to increasing trust between law enforcement and the people they serve. As police arrive, a female and male officer grabbed the white teen off the black teen. What does that say? That says the white teen upon their arrival was the aggressor. The white teen is placed onto the couch while the male officer tackles the black male teen to the ground. Straddles his back, crosses his hands to handcuff him while the female officer appears to have her knee on his back. The video shows no sign of resistance from the black male team. It's cause he's black, racially motivated. A female voice is heard saying in the video. As the black teen is being handcuffed on the ground, the white teen is seen standing up looking at the officers before the female officer sits him back on the couch as the black teen is lifted off the ground by the male officer. The video cuts off at this point in a Facebook post Monday. The Bridge Water Police Department said it was aware of the video. Here's a quote from that police department. We recognize that this video has made members of our community upset and are calling for an internal affairs investigation. The officers were able to respond quickly to this incident and stop it from escalating because of a tip we received from the community. We have requested that the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office assist us in this matter and are requesting patience as we strictly adhere to the New Jersey Attorney General's internal affairs. All right, uh, damn the patience, we have no patience for you. We have none and we don't need it. We clearly see what happened here. You know, there's no patience when there's an actual criminal, right? You don't say, well, wait a minute guys, let's discuss this. I mean, the guy may not be breaking the law here, no. We demand justice, we demand it to be swift, we demand it to be transparent, and we demand it now. Future attorney at law, my dear sister, what are your thoughts on this case? I mean, truth be told, this is ridiculous. We saw exactly what happened in the video. Mm -hmm. It's clear racial bias, right, racial bias. And I think the fact that they're trying to do an internal investigation is not enough. They need to reprimand the officers out loud in front of everybody. Just the way they disrespected and, and you know embarrassed that young black boy when they attacked him. And we need more accountability in our police force. This is a problem when we do not properly train our police officers and we do not have a um, we don't have enough diversity in our police field. This is what happens. You think yeah. it's okay, and we treat our young black boys as if they're men and that is a child. And so they need to be reprimanded. NBC News reporting that scientists may have found a cure again. I say again intentionally for HIV. Let me take you to the American research team. They have now reported that it is possible they have cured HIV in a woman for the first time. Now, there's some background to this that's very important to note. Building on past successes as well as failures in the HIV cure research field. These scientists used a cutting edge stem cell transplant method. This is a dangerous method, by the way, but can be highly effective. That they expect will expand the pool of people who could receive similar treatment to several dozen annually. Their patient stepped into a rare club that includes three men whom scientists have already cured. This is on the record, um, or very likely cured of HIV. Researchers also know of two women, two women whose own immune systems have quite extraordinarily apparently vanquished the virus. That's on record again, research documented, it's on the record, all right? Let me take you to the first case. The first case of what was deemed 
a successful HIV cure, investigators treated the American Timothy Ray Brown for acute AML. He received a stem cell transplant from a donor who had a rare genetic abnormality that grants the immune cells that HIV targets natural resistance to the virus. The strategy in Brown's case, which was the first, which was first made public in 2008, has since apparently cured HIV into other people, but has failed a string of others. So there's a trial and error here. Now, here's the important part of this study or this science as well. It is very dangerous for many. Noting it is unethical, experts stress, to attempt an HIV cure through a stem cell transplant, a toxic, sometimes fatal procedure. In anyone who does not have a potentially fatal cancer or other condition that already makes them a candidate for such risky treatment. Dr. Deborah Persuade, a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine, who chairs the NIH funded scientific committee behind the new case study, said that while we're very excited about the new case of possible HIV cure, the stem cell treatment method is still not a feasible strategy for all, but a handful of the millions of people living with HIV. Now, let me tell you why this story is very important for us to follow, to highlight and to discuss. HIV AIDS, it goes through black communities in particular in a very unique and very aggressive way. For the last 10 years, I've worked with an HIV AIDS nonprofit where we do free testing, individuals that test positive, we then connect them to wraparound services to make sure they're able to live healthy, to live long and to protect themselves and others, okay? Those organizations are needed. Well, because of former President Donald Trump, many of those groups got defunded. We need money to be returned back to those organizations quickly. But there's also research being done on the cure side and you see some light here. But the vast majority of individuals living with HIV AIDS will not receive this kind of treatment. It's risky, it's dangerous, and it is not commonly available, all right? So good news on one hand, still a problem on the other. We have to continue to fight the good fight on this while dispelling myths about the narrative of HIV AIDS. My dear sister, what are your thoughts on this? We gotta get this done. Cause yeah. there's so many of us in our community that are suffering from HIV and AIDS. And we also need to start educating our people more on HIV and AIDS and how it's actually being transmitted and how quickly it's being transmitted in our communities. Cause I don't think we believe the numbers. Yeah. So I think we need to start getting more information out there about the numbers. But I also know because it's us. That's the most affected. Sometimes that's why they being real slow about getting that mm-hmm. cure out because mm-hmm. it's more of us. But yeah, we need to get this going. We need, we need to, to get it going. And um, I encourage everyone, listen, if you can volunteer a little time, typically the CDC provides training, other nonprofits in your area, they, they will provide training to make sure you know how to give what's called the oral swab test. There's also a blood test that you can uh, that you can give and uh, be trained to give uh, through the federal government to test individuals for the antibodies and connect them to wraparound services. It's fulfilling work and the individuals who are involved in that work, they do so they do so with significant heart. And so big ups to all of those organizations. All right, Zimmerman, Sam George Zimmerman, still in the news, suing the parents of the child that he killed. Well, a judge has now tossed that lawsuit out. Let me give you some background to what this killer has now done. A Florida judge has tossed out the $100 million lawsuit against the parents of Trayvon Martin and others filed by George Zimmerman. Let me give you some background to remind you of the coverage of this young man and his untimely death. In the moments before he was shot dead, Trayvon Martin knew he was being followed. He was running scared and that the man chasing him, neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman muttered something under his breath, which many people believe was a racial slur. Muttered by George Zimmerman to a police dispatcher just seconds before he shot Martin. It comes just before this exchange. Are you following him? 
Yeah, okay, we don't need you to do that. ABC News has also learned they missed this. The chilling words of Martin's 16-year-old girlfriend, who phone logs show was on the phone with him in the seconds before his death. <laughs> In this reenactment from last March, George Zimmerman argues the 14 screams were his. Proof, he says, that he fired that single shot at the 17-year-old in self-defense. But Martin's family and prosecutors say the call proves Martin was crying for help before he was killed. So sad. Let's put up a picture of this killer, George Zimmerman. The chief allegation in the lawsuit was the attorney helped to swap out reluctant witnesses, Brittany Diamond Eugene for a half sister, Rachel Gentile, and helped prepare her to deliver false testimony. So that's what Zimmerman is claiming in the lawsuit. The suit accuses Trayvon's parents, prosecutors and state authorities of going along with the alleged deceit. All right, let me show you a picture of the parents. Sabrina Fulton, Tracy Martin reacting to the charges against Zimmerman. This was taken April 11, 2012. That's how long it's been. April 11, 2012. This killer is still messing with this family. As reported by CBS Miami, a Florida judge has dismissed this defamation and conspiracy lawsuit. Former neighborhood watch volunteer George Zimmerman had filed against the parents of Trayvon Martin. The teen he fatally shot almost a decade ago in a case that drew international attention about race and gun violence in the country. Judge John Cooper in Tallahassee dis dismissed all counts against all defendants in the lawsuit, which by the way included Benjamin Crump, who represented the family and others. In his order, the judge wrote that Zimmerman had failed to show any fraudulent representation and said any further arguments in the case would be futile. There can be no claim for conspiracy to defraud if there is no adequately stated claim for fraud. Cooper wrote in the order filed more than two weeks ago. All right. Now, um, obviously, when this happened, many of us looked at it and we said, there's a kid with Skittles, he's not a danger to anyone. Zimmerman is obviously guilty, that's not what happened here, right? The system worked in favor of Zimmerman. I will never forget watching this killer go free and my daughter is watching the news with me at home. And my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, I do not understand. He said he did it. He's not going to jail. And that's when I had to have that conversation with my baby girl. Sister, what's your thoughts here? This is a hard one. Um, I think this one still hits home. I feel like. First of all, we should have took care of Zimmerman a long time ago when we could have. But this is why we need to understand the law and know how the laws work. And we need to know our rights. Mm -hmm. Also need to make sure we're showing up for jury duty and that we're voting for our local judges um, who sit on our county benches. Because when we do that, we take the power yeah. from, from the other side. This, I'm, I'm confused as to who even filed this lawsuit for him. I'm wondering if he went pro per because it sounds extremely mm. frivolous. <laughs> at right. this um, and it's ridiculous to even continue to try to put this family through all this pain. And you caused all this chaos years ago. But hopefully moving forward, this is a lesson. We need to stay on top of our laws and we need to stay on top of being inside the court. Yeah, very well said. And that's why we need people like you in the legal profession. All right, we got more. On the other side is indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. It's indisputable. So let me remind everyone of the big homie, JR Jackson, the watch list. That's live weekdays, 12 p.m. 
Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Find out the stories you should be paying attention to, news, politics, culture, current events, sports, and more. 10 week test series at TYT. Make sure to support JR by watching live daily. And don't forget to subscribe, right? Real simple, youtube.com forward slash watch list TYT and facebook.com forward slash watch list TYT. Also, newsletter at TYT, we're all about driving positive change. And that's why we want our newsletter to become the must read for you. We're going to accomplish that by bringing you a different approach to the newsletter. We want you to know what's happening in news and politics through the lens of progressives. Real simple, subscribe today at tyt.com forward slash newsletters, tyt.com forward slash newsletters. Also shop TYT, celebrate 20 years of TYT with 20% off site wide. Shop tyt.com. You know, I got those I wish you Karen Wood shirts. We got the anti Karen shirts. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff, right? So make sure you go there. Uh, and for an added bonus, uh, we dropped two new designs for the 20th anniversary merch and Canvas 2022. We've covered a lot of these stories across the country. School board members being threatened with physical violence and death because they do common sense things like pass rules to protect children. Well, there's a school board member whose child received a letter saying your mama is going to die. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what it says. All right, let me take you to um, let me take you to this situation. Let's put up a picture of the school board member, okay? Local school officials across the United States are being inundated with threats of violence and other hostile messages from harassers nationwide, fueled by anger over masks and other issues inside of the school. So a letter came to the home of Brenda Brenda Sheridan in Loudoun County, Virginia. This is a Virginia school board member, but it was addressed to one of her children. It threatened to kill them both unless she left the board. Now, remember when conservatives were all up in arms about the FBI or the Department of Justice helping local law enforcement investigate these particular threats? And they were saying, they want the FBI to investigate parents. Well, damn it, if it's a parent doing it, they need to be investigated. That's how that works, right? And they said, well, well, we don't need the Department of Justice to start targeting parents. If parents are trying to kill board members of a school board, yes, if the local authorities, if they don't have the resources to investigate it, and many times they don't, that's exactly what should happen. Now, I want to remind you, many times these threats come from outside of the district and sometimes outside of the state, which means by way of jurisdiction, local law enforcement, they're limited. They're limited in manpower and they're limited in actual jurisdiction. So you need to have the proper jurisdictional investigative agency connected to a task force or coalition to investigate it properly. It gets deeper. The letter reads, let's put up the letter. The letter reads, it's too bad that your mother is an ugly communist whore. Said the handwritten note, which the family read just after Christmas. If she doesn't quit or resign before the end of the year, we will kill her. But first, we will kill you. Now imagine getting this kind of note about your mom. Imagine this, and all your mom has done is serve. Nobody runs and serves on the school board because they want to make a bunch of money, because they don't get paid a bunch of money. 90% of those who serve on school boards are people who are active in their local community. They care deeply, care deeply about their local schools and they are typically parents, all right? While investigating death threats to school board members, a Reuters found about half of the hostile messages documented were sent to Sheridan, a former chair of the Loudoun County Virginia School Board. Amid controversies over 
coronavirus protections, anti-racism efforts, and bathroom policy. 22 messages sent to Sheridan or the entire board included death threats or said members should be or would be killed. In June, she was received a threat saying, and I quote Brenda, I am going to gut you like the fat mm, pig you are when I find you. More investigation uncovered school board members across the United States have endured a rash of terroristic threats and hostile messages ignited by rolling controversies over policies on curtailing the coronavirus, bathroom access for transgender students, and the teaching of America's true racial history. That's the whole CRT debate, right? Reuters documented the intimidation through contacts and interviews with 33 board members across 15 states and a review of threatening and harassing messages obtained from the officials or through public records request. The news organization found more than 222 such messages in this sampling of districts, a sampling, a sampling of districts. School officials or parents in 15 different counties received a witness threats they consider serious enough to report to the police. School officials reported the messages to law enforcement in those three cases as in many others documented by Reuters. No one, no one has been arrested for sending this threatening message. Though a few people have been arrested for unruly or threatening behavior at board meetings. This is why the Department of Justice was getting involved because the issue is systemic. The issue is nationwide, it is not isolated to a local jurisdiction. And typically these threats come outside of that city. Many times we've even seen them travel as a crew from state to state threatening school board members. It's important to note a hundred percent of these folks and damn it, I am absolutely making an assumption. But I would take this assumption to the bank. A hundred percent of these folks are Trump supporters. Let's keep it 100. Sister, what are your thoughts here? All I heard was terroristic threats, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Mm-hmm. During children, I hear charges. Where are the police? We need to investigate this. We really have to protect our school teachers and our school boards. If it weren't for teachers, where would half of us be? Let's be That's honest right. about that. And this is getting ridiculous. And I agree with you. I think that most of them probably are Trump supporters. They got away with that little riot on January 6th, and they think they can do what they want to do now. Mm-hmm. To get in, in front of this right now before it starts to spread. We don't need to wait until somebody come and start really hurting people like they clearly are doing yeah. in a few cases this year. We don't need to wait until it gets there. This needs to be taken serious and nipped in the bud right here, right now. Yeah, and it can be. They have the resources, they have the manpower. I'm talking about nationally. Now, here's what has to happen Washington or the federal government, they have to stop bending. For these local movements that say, no, 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 we don't want the federal government, damn that. We need the federal government to be involved, all right? There are a lot of people throughout this country who are not even reporting the threats. I know of some of them personally who aren't even reporting the threats they're receiving because they don't want to become part of the news story. So the sample that we have, which is massive by the way, is a fraction of the threats they are receiving as members of the school board. And we reported on something a few months ago where there was one county official who was run off the road by a disgruntled citizen because of their stance on mask in the county. Literally tried to kill this person at over 70 miles per hour. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. Family man inside of his home, police kick in his door. He's not the target of the warrant, a device is. He shoots, he's trying to protect his family. He drops his gun as soon as he realizes it's the police. No police gets shot. They grab his children, they drop his baby, injure his baby seriously. And then they try to cover it up. And then they charge him, the father, with attempted murder on a police officer. Let me bring your attention to Pensacola. 
Let's put up a picture of this family. The Pensacola Police Department says it has launched an internal affairs investigation after parents say a child was hurt while in police custody following last week's police involved shooting. This guy was not a target of the warrant. He's a youth mentor, has no criminal record, all right? The father that you see in this picture, his name is Corey Marino Jr. He was asleep at his home with his two kids, one and three, when the police bust in at about 5 a.m. after only knocking and announcing for 10 seconds. After being awakened by the force entry, the dad fires one shot at the door because he thinks it's an intruder. Naturally, the bullet hits the police shield. Then he realizes it's the cops and what does he do? He puts down his gun, he apologizes, he gets down, all right? Now, they did all of this in 10 seconds. The policy says they're supposed to wait 15. And when they were told, hey, um, you all said 10, you were supposed to wait 15. They then said, oh, no, 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 it was, it was actually 15. With hands up, the dad is apologizing profusely, all right? This is what's happening when the cops busted in. The cops apparently had a warrant, but it was not for the dad. It was for computer equipment that belonged to somebody else. They charged the dad with attempted murder on a police officer. This story gets even deeper. Marino Jr., no criminal record. Pensacola police says he is not a suspect in the January shooting investigation that led police to his home, not even the guy, okay? In the process of arrest, The police take the kids, let's put up a picture of the trauma the one year old received. They drop the one year old, okay? You see it right there, you see the injury. And then they tried to cover it up, did not tell the dad they dropped his kid. Here's how the infant was dropped. Now, I gotta give credit to Olivia Iverson. A local journalist, let's put up her tweet. Olivia Iverson tweeted, PPD also confirmed that Marino's family told us an investigator put the man's kid in the back of a patrol car and briefly left the vehicle. When he reopened the door, the child was leaning on it and fell out. Police say EMS checked him out and released kids to the family. That was the narrative, okay? So follow the narrative, follow the deceit here. They've already They've already dropped the baby. They don't want EMS to check them out, all right? Cops prevented EMS from taking the toddler to the hospital. Um, Escambia County tells Channel 3 that EMS was called at about 6.40 a.m. Now, remember, this happened at 5 a.m., so we got an hour and 40 minutes already passed for a hemorrhage and laceration on the toddler. They arrived six minutes later. The county could not specify what EMS saw and said, but it claims the call was canceled 20 minutes later. The child's mother, Ms. Dixon, was called to the scene and said, and I quote, I get out my car like, where's my baby? Where's my baby, Ms. Dixon said. And I get my baby and I see his face and it's almost unrecognizable compared to how he looked when I left him last. The toddler was not taken to the hospital by EMS, so Dixon, took him herself. Dozens of pages of paperwork from the hospital document the child's injuries after CAT scan and x-rays. Ms. Dixon claims the Florida Department of Children and Family Services, they are investigating. The reporter, Olivia Iverson tweeted online what happened when she tried to interview the chief of police. She said, I was scheduled to interview Chief Eric Randall on Friday. But after I brought PPD the mother's concerns, they, number one, backed out of the interview. Number two, launched an internal affairs investigation. And number three, Randall met with the mom in person and apologized. She also tweeted about the fallout for the father. Let's put this up. Olivia Iverson said, meanwhile, the father still faces a charge for attempted murder. Attempted murder, that means you must have malice intent, intentional intent to harm, none of that happened here. He is still facing a charge for attempted murder of a law enforcement officer and has already lost his job over all of this. 
None of them know why police want information from them for an investigation. They say Mr. Marino is not even a suspect for. Let's put up a picture of the chief here, okay? All right, they plan hide the pickle with the officers. So we have a game too. We put up the picture of the head guy in charge. That's your chief, Eric Randall. Eric, the hell is wrong with you? You need to get your life together, chief. Your department is dirty. They went ran into the house of a good man. And let me make an appeal to this chief. You know this is a good man. You know he's a decent individual. You know your officers have charged him with something he did not do. He did not attempt to kill or murder anybody. Murder means malice intent, you know that. My dear sister, Ms. Tucker, you are a future attorney. You know exactly what it means to be charged with murder because we studied this in law school. There is no murder qualifier here whatsoever based on the statutory language and the elements needed for the crime. And that's the thing, you have to hit every single element. That's right. Have the intent, you don't have an attempted murder at all. And especially if they didn't follow protocol and they came came in at 10 seconds instead of 15, you're really gonna lose that case. So they need to go ahead and let that one go. What they're trying to do is stall out because they know they know they are going to get a lawsuit. If I were Ms. Dixon, I would absolutely be all over the police department right now with suing them for everything they have done. But for that man to lose his job and to be, that's an emotional trauma as well. You bust up in my house and I didn't know who it was. But it's Florida, first of all. So we should have known it was gonna be someone we heard it was Florida. Let's start there. But aren't they the ones where protect my ground or protect my castle, all of that? So why do you get to bust up in my house and I can't protect my family? Yeah. Yeah, you see, and that's the application of the law. You know, laws look equal when you just read them. It's the application of them where you see the extreme bias and the manipulation. There's a homeless man who was jaywalking. He ends up being killed by the police. Let me take you to the video. Like this, you need to have a, a control. There we go. Come on, man. How you doing? How you doing? You gonna stop me? Make you stop. Telling me stop. For what? I'm walking. For jail walking. What are you talking about? I'm walking. Stop. Get up. Get up. Get up. Stop. Man. I'm walking. Stop. For what? Because you're jaywalking. Get over on the side Where? Of the walk. Where? Right there. Where? 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 It's a controlled intersection. What intersection? I've been on this side of the street from this west, from that place. Right there. Right there. Where did I take Stop touching. Stop touching. Stop touching. Stop touching. Stop touching. Stop touching. I mean, why are you stopping? Stop touching. Stop touching. Stop touching. They killed him, he's dead, he was jaywalking. That's what the cops said. Let's put up the picture of Mr. Kurt Reinhold. That's him, say his name, Kurt Reinhold, 42 years of age, father of two, former bodybuilder, had fallen on hard times and he was homeless. Keep his picture up, an Orange County Sheriff's deputy was determined by the Orange County DA's office to be justified in his fatal September 2020 shooting of a homeless black man in California, who deputies said committed the crime of jaywalking. Deputy Duran, 
was cleared of all wrongdoing in this shooting of a 42 year old named Kurt Reinhold. In an investigation that looked into the fatal shooting that eventually led to protest, Reinhold's family says he suffered from mental illness and often did not stay on his medication. Now it's important to note something here that I think is underreported in this story. The officers who did this are homeless liaison officers. They are supposed to be specially trained and equipped to deal with homelessness. Understand that homelessness has connectional factors. You may have an underlying issue of mental health, right? And if you're homeless, listen, if I'm homeless for a few days straight, I guarantee you I will have a mental health issue. <sighs> Duran and his partner, uh, Deputy Jonathan Israel, were both uh, homeless liaison officers. Uh, we are not able to get a picture of both of them. So per protocol, put up the picture of the chief, the county sheriff, excuse me, Don Barnes. Uh, Don Barnes is the guy in charge, buck stops with him. Who's the DA that decided that uh, this homeless uh, brother who was temporarily unsheltered, all right, who fell on hard times, did not deserve justice. Put up the picture of the district attorney, all right. Todd Spitzer is the DA. There he is. One of the attorneys representing Reinhold's family said, according to Mercury News, disappointed but not surprising. When reacting to the deputy being cleared, he also thinks the police stop was racially motivated and had no reason to kill Reinhold. The DA's office and leaders of the sheriff's department say Reinhold was reaching for the deputy's gun while in a struggle with them. There's also surveillance footage from the hotel close, and it looks like it shows Reinhold's hand going towards Duran's gun, but Reinhold's family claims his arms were just flailing while he was on the concrete and not reaching for the gun, according to Mercury News. In a statement from the family, they say, and I quote, this conclusion from the report confirms what we have been saying since day one. Deputies Israel and Duran had no reason whatsoever to stop Mr. Reinhold. This was a racially motivated stop aimed at harassing Mr. Reinhold, nothing more. Now, once again, I have to remind everyone, everyone, these were supposed to be officers who were specially trained and specially equipped to handle crisis of homelessness. Jaywalking is walking. Let's not get fixated on jaywalking being a crime. Jaywalking isn't a real damn crime. It's walking. A human being is dead for walking. Ms. Tucker, what are your thoughts here? It sounded real Terry v. Ohio to me, walking while black. No, that's why we need to know our laws so that we know. First of all, it's the difference between a murder and a killing, right? So mm -hmm. they have to allow them to get over the threshold of that. But this is unfortunately, we have allowed this type of behavior in our law enforcement for a very long time. They targeted that man. There was no reason for them to harass him. However, Police only need reasonable suspicion. We don't have a real standard for that. So you could be reasonably suspicious for whatever reason. And who's who's the reasonable person? Is it a reasonable me, a reasonable right. person, a reasonable black person, right? So that's the problem and that's why we need to stay on top of it. This is not okay. We cannot keep allowing our black men to be essentially slaughtered by police officers because they're just untrained properly, like it's ridiculous. Yeah, and they carry around their hyper aggressive bias and their implicit bias. And here's the reality of the law. The law in many ways is a very subjective standard, even though it has the disguise of objectivity. In this case, while legally and technically 
Uh, there may be a policy protocol or a statute that protects them. The reality is this man should be alive. The way we have allowed law enforcement to rule the industry, we don't allow any other industry to do that. If you are a medical doctor, you have a higher standard of responsibility. If you are a psychiatrist, you have a higher standard of care. If you are a professor, you have a higher standard of care. If you are a police officer, you have a lower standard of responsibility that you or I, you or I have a higher standard more so than cops when it comes to the negligence of human life. Mm. All right, okay, a cop rips a black man's prosthetic leg off during the arrest. Arrest. It was glued to his body, okay? Let's put up a picture of Mr. Waverly Lucas. Give me some background. During a wrongful arrest in New York, police violently removed a man's prosthetic leg that left him with injuries and severe emotional trauma. Here's how this went down. Mr. Lucas, a New York man with a prosthetic leg, is seeking millions of damages from the Suffolk Police uh, County Police Department, saying he was wrongfully arrested and injured by officers. He also claims officers ripped off his leg and threw it in the trunk of the police cruiser, NBC New York reports. Waverly Lucas was heading into a store when police officers stopped him and accused him of public urination, demanding he show identification. When Lucas refused to provide his ID, the officers began to assault him, all right? The police then ripped off the man's leg, prosthetic leg, to make him fit into the vehicle and then threw it in the trunk of the police cruiser. To rip that off, it's like someone ripping off your skin because it's like it's almost glued to my skin. A total of four police cars were called to the scene for a man who had one leg. Waverly says, He is left with a fractured orbital bone, fractured eye socket, and a broken wrist from the incident. The man was charged with possession of pills, a medication he is legally prescribed by the way to treat his leg condition. As he waits for the criminal case to be resolved, he's also waiting for his prosthetic leg to be returned. They kept it, these SOBs. Ms. Tucker. I just can't. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just, I can't with this one. It's just, look, if you're too scary to be the police and you can't do your job, go ahead and find you something else to do. Cause this is getting ridiculous. I think we probably need to come up with a committee, the police own black people crime committee or something. Cause that's ridiculous. This is a handicapped man, yeah. okay? You are completely violating not only his personal rights, but his civil rights. And it's just ridiculous, for what? He has yeah. one leg and got four cops, four cop cars. Right, and then the way they handle this, okay? All right, if you think someone has urinated publicly, right? You now want to arrest them, rip off their leg and then charge them with a frivolous charge. But here's the thing, you didn't charge him with what you said he did. You charge him with pills, okay? Right. Now, loose pills, that's a felony by the way. That's a felony charge, okay? The public urination is not, even if that was true. I don't think it was, but even if it was true, it's not even a felony. But they decided to charge him with something else. Now, here's the thing. Once again, there's a reality here to where law enforcement act more like slave patrol, where they want you to show them your freedom papers, right? Show them the reason why you should exist, okay? There's an issue in law enforcement, and that's why I tell people, law enforcement does not need to be fixed because it's working the way it was designed to work. The industry of law enforcement needs to be broken so that we can remake it and have it be a reflection of the sentiment of the community today. Because law enforcement as we know it is still by and large a sentiment of the original design which was slave patrol. All right, my dear sister, you did a great job. Thank you for being on Indisputable. Tell people how they can follow your great work. You can follow me on TikTok, I, I am legally hype. You can follow me on Twitter, same same. I am legally hype handle. And you can follow me on YouTube and what else? I'm, I'm everywhere. You're everywhere, I'm you're everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> uh, sister, you know, we are so proud of you. 
If you need anything, all you gotta do is hit us up, okay? Thank you so much, thank you for having me. Absolutely, all right.